Hello, and welcome to this online tutorial on instance space analysis. I'm Kate Smith Miles, and I'll be joined later by my colleague, Mario Andres Minos, for part two. The outline for our tutorial today is part one, where I'll present an introduction to instance space analysis. And I'll also introduce the online tool that we've created called Matilda to give everybody access to the methodology. And throughout my presentation, I'll be using one case study to illustrate all the concepts, and that's university timetabling, a classic optimization problem. Mario Andres will then, in part two, show you how you can create your own instance space analysis for a problem of your choice. Um, and he'll take you through the MATLAB code with a live script and talk about Matilda's web interface and how to set the parameters. And in his presentation, he'll be using a case study from machine learning classification. So let's get started with part one, introduction to instance space analysis, what it's all about, why we developed it 12 years ago, uh, and what it can do. So the motivation for instance space analysis really came from a time about 12 years ago when I was an editor of a journal. And I would receive a lot of submissions from authors around the world. And the standard approach was this. I've developed a new algorithm and I've tested it on a handful of test problems and my algorithm is better than some other ones I've compared it to, uh, so please publish my paper. And this is standard research practice where we report algorithm performance averaged across a set of chosen test problems. And if your algorithm's performance is better on average than some competing algorithms, then we typically draw a conclusion that the algorithm is successful and we should publish that work. So what's wrong with that, you might wonder? Well, there are a couple of concerns. The first concern is which test instances did you choose and why? Were they hand-selected uh, because your algorithm actually did quite well on them and you're proud of the performance? Um, were they selected because the previous authors used those ones, but we never questioned where these instances came from or why we've inherited them? Uh, and the other concern is that weaknesses are rarely reported we have this concept of negative results that are not publishable. So we tend to select instances where our algorithm does well, we shine a positive light on those results, uh, but that's not always very helpful. Uh, and so we often find referees will get concerned about the choice of test instances and they will suggest to authors, oh, you need to test your algorithm on this set of benchmark problems you download from this website. That's the correct thing to do. And so then in the revised version, the authors will extend their analysis to include some commonly studied benchmark problems. And of course, these common benchmarks are really important for fair comparisons, but we do have to ask the question of whether they are indeed adequate themselves. Where did those benchmarks come from? Uh, what's the history of them? Why were they first proposed? Are they fit for purpose now when an algorithms have advanced so much? Problems that used to be hard to solve maybe no longer are. Um, are the benchmarks unbiased? Are they representative of real world problems? These are questions that we need to ask. Um, and so I believe that test instances should ideally be very diverse. They should be completely lacking bias. They should be challenging. They should be discriminating of different algorithms performance. There's no point having benchmarks where every algorithm performs the same on them. That we don't learn anything interesting from that. Uh, and they also need to span a range of real world contexts where we're likely to deploy these algorithms. And these properties of test instances really need to be scrutinized. But the problem is that we don't have a way of easily seeing whether or not a chosen set of test instances satisfy these criteria. Instance space analysis is a solution for that. The second concern that I have with standard practice is that averaging algorithm performance across a set of benchmarks as good as they might be, uh, is not nuanced enough to be able to really understand the strengths and weaknesses of an algorithm. You see, the algorithm that is best on average probably has weaknesses that we just aren't seeing. It's all hidden in the average. And there's the notion of the no free lunch theorem that tells us that if one algorithm uh, does well on one set of test problems, there's probably another set of test problems where it doesn't do so well on. We have a responsibility to try to find the weaknesses of our algorithm and to report that honestly. We need to understand how the characteristics of an instance affects the behavior of the algorithm. That's how we can understand whether an algorithm is suitable for a future problem. So under what conditions do we expect one algorithm to be better than another? 
what are the characteristics of the instances that give an algorithm something to exploit? It gives it a competitive advantage. And what are the characteristics of instances where it has a weakness and it will struggle? So I believe that algorithm performance should not be reported on average across a set of benchmark problems, but should be based on instance properties. And we have to understand how the characteristics of the instances affect the performance of algorithms. So those are two concerns that I have with standard practice that have motivated the development of instance space analysis about 12 years ago. So I'm going to present an example uh, that will help illustrate some of the concepts and make sure that we have a shared understanding of the terminology that I'm using. So I'm going to look at university course timetabling as a classic example because I think we can all understand well what the problem is and the challenges of why some university timetabling problems may be easy and some may be hard depending on the characteristics of the university and its facilities and its student demand and the number of courses you can see how some might be quite straightforward and some might be very, very difficult to, to find the optimal solution. So the International Timetabling Competition back in 2007 had a bunch of real world instances from the University of Udine in Italy. Uh, and the two winning algorithms from that competition were a to-do search uh, and a simulated kneeling algorithm. So when we look at those two algorithms and we look at the performance across a bunch of practical optimization problems that have come from Italy, 21 real world instances that were the competition instances. Plus we can randomly generate timetabling problems as well. Um, Edmund Burke's team had a generator. Um, so I've looked at 4,492 randomly generated instances. And there's also 3,686 instances that we have generated by taking the random generator uh, of Burke and adapting it using machine learning techniques to make those instances a bit more real world like, a bit more like the Italian university instances. So we have um, over 8,000 instances that we have um, applied to two highly competitive algorithms. And here are the results. So this is a standard statistical analysis. This is what we would get when we average performance across a large collection of benchmarks. We can count the number of instances of the 8,199, how many times was simulated kneeling, this is simulated kneeling with constraint propagation, how many times was that best? You can see that for different types of instances, so for the Italian university instances, in University of Udine in the third row, we see that eight times simulated kneeling was best, 10 times to research was best, three times they were tied for the total of 21 instances. So the Italian university instances, um, it's a bit too close to call which algorithm is best on average. For the randomly generated instances, uh, we see that uh, there are 4,492 of them. In over 3,000 cases, the two algorithms got a tied performance as measured by the number of student clashes. Right? So they both achieved solutions that were quite similar in terms of quality. Um, you can see that taboo search uh, was twice as good as simulated kneeling on the randomly generated instances. But these other ones, these real world like instances, it's a different story. Uh, simulated kneeling was slightly better than taboo search. So this kind of standard statistical analysis leads you to draw a conclusion, which is these two algorithms are uh, quite competitive with each other. Many times, 45% of the time, they're tied. Um, but if you had to pick one over the other, you'd say Taboo Search had a slight edge on average. Okay, so that's a standard statistical analysis. Uh, what I'm going to show you is the instance space analysis helps us dig into those results and, and get much more insight into the strengths and weaknesses of each algorithm. So which algorithm is better? On average, it's pretty close. You'd have to say Taboo Search was slightly better on average. But what are its weaknesses? And I'll give you a spoiler alert, both of these algorithms do have weaknesses that are revealed through instance space analysis. We will get to that soon. So of course, I'm not the only person who's pointing out concerns with standard practice. It's been a long-standing criticism, um, dating back to John Hooker in 1994, where he said we need an empirical science of algorithms. And the following year, testing heuristics, we have it all wrong. This cherry picking, examples and reporting how algorithms perform on average on a small set of problems or even a large set of problems without scrutinizing where those instances came from and are they fit for purpose um, is, has long been recognized as a problem. 
uh, Catherine McGeek with the experimental analysis of algorithms um, complained about the same uh, concerns and Paul and Costner as well um, have written extensively on how we should be generating experimental data um, so that we can do this more rigorously. I believe it's no one's fault that standard practice of reporting average performance across these unscrutinised test suites continues. Um, researchers have not had the methodologies or tools to enable them to do it any other way. Uh, so this is part of my motivation for developing instance space analysis and the online tool Matilda. So the goals of instance space analysis then are to be able to understand and visualise the strengths and weaknesses of algorithms because all algorithms do have weaknesses. We need to understand which algorithm should be used when, and more importantly, why, under what conditions, why is an algorithm exhibiting strength or weakness. We want to be able to facilitate more objective assessment of algorithmic power across the broadest possible instance space, not just saying my algorithm does well on these instances, but how does your algorithm perform across the whole space of possible instances that you could throw at it? Um, how, what is the boundary of that space? How do we understand the range of possible uh, test problems? We do this because we want to improve research practice, of course, but we also need to establish algorithmic trust. And this is a huge emerging topic of how do we trust algorithms? And that really comes down to how rigorously they're tested. So the project that I have funded by the Australian Research Council that has funded all this work is called Stress Testing Algorithms. It's about scrutinising how well algorithms perform under different conditions. And of course, in practical terms, we need to make sure we're picking the right algorithm for the right time so that we can avoid deployment disasters. The goal of instance space analysis is also to help guide the generation of new test instances with controllable characteristics so we can fill these instance spaces with test problems that have such diverse characteristics that we know exactly how algorithms are going to perform under different conditions. Uh, so we can expand existing benchmarks and make sure that they fit the purpose and we can have new test problems that teach us things about how algorithms perform to drive further insights and new algorithm development as well. So there's a, a number of open questions that we need to address as part of our quest for uh, a more rigorous approach to stress testing algorithms. We need to figure out how instance features can help us understand the strengths and weaknesses of algorithms. What are the properties of a timetabling problem, for instance? What are the differences between what a randomly generated timetabling problem looks like and what these Italian university instances look like? And how do those properties or features affect the performance of the algorithms? We need to figure out how we can uh, infer the performance of algorithms across a huge instance space when we only have evidence of how they performed on certain points. How can we visualise the space of all possible instances and understand how an algorithm will perform across that space? That's a statistical or a machine learning question. How do we measure objectively the relative performance of algorithms, the strengths and weaknesses relative to each other? Uh, we need to look at the existing benchmark instances found in the literature for a number of different problems and ask how easy or hard are they? Is it time to update the benchmarks? Uh, and then how do we generate new test instances that are going to give us the insights that we require? If we notice that there's a, an absence of instances in a certain part of the space, methodologically, how can we generate new instances that will lie there? So these are the kind of questions that have guided my research for the last 12 years. Uh, so technically, the challenges to answering those questions, um, we have to be able to visualise the space of all possible test instances, which means we have to identify which features affect performance? That's always a critical question for when you apply instance space analysis to any new problem. How do the features actually affect performance? Which features are important to measure? How do we mathematically define the boundary of the feature space and the instance space? And what's the best way to project uh, from this high dimensional feature space to 2D so that we can see everything very clearly um, and where all the instances lie within that theoretical boundary? Uh, in order to scrutinize the benchmarks, we, uh, we need methods for how we can identify the regions where we would enhance the benchmarks. Um, if we notice that they're lacking, how can we uh, fill those gaps? And 
there's a challenge in trying to gain insights into strengths and weaknesses of algorithms. Uh, we can quantitatively try to measure the area of what I call the footprint of the algorithm. This is the region in the instance space where an algorithm has, we have evidence that it's actually good. We can generalize that region. Uh, and qualitatively, we want to be able to understand how the instance features affect that algorithm performance and, and that algorithm footprint. Uh, if we identify that an algorithm has strength in a certain region, we want to know what are the kinds of instances that lie in that region. We have a challenge to perform automated algorithm selection based on instance features and a challenge to try to design new algorithms that are based on these insights to ensure that we have footprints that cover the entire space and a full portfolio approach that we have a portfolio of rich algorithms whose footprints cover the space so we can tackle any problem that falls within that boundary. So the framework we use for instance space analysis is built upon the seminal work of John Rice in 1976. He posed the algorithm selection problem, which involves looking at a subset of instances, problem instances, I, calculating a feature vector for those instances, things that affect the difficulty of those instances, having a collection of algorithms whose performance we measure. And so you have spaces for instances, features, algorithms, and performance metrics. And this collectively, this IFYA, if you is known as the metadata. And so inside the dotted uh, box here was John Rice's algorithm selection problem. And he used regression models for learning the relationship between features and algorithm performance. Given a problem instance with a feature vector, can we predict the algorithm performance? So then we can know which algorithm we should use when. We use the one that has the best predicted performance. Uh, but the thing about if you, I always like to say, if you don't like the metadata, you're not stuck with it, you can change the metadata, you can generate new instances, you can think of new features, you can add new algorithms, you can measure performance in many different ways. So this is not a static collection of data. We are free to change the data to make it everything we need so that we can learn and gain insights. So I use the Rice algorithm selection problem as the basis of the framework and, and I've extended it because we have to acknowledge that actually there's this broader problem space we have a set, a set of instances on the computer, but there's a broader problem space that we're trying to make inferences about. So let's call that the problem space, and then we get a, a collection of instances with empirical data. We know how algorithms perform on those instances. Once we have this metadata, we can construct through dimensional reduction techniques a 2D representation of that instance space. Uh, and we can also look at footprints within that instance space, the regions in the 2D space where an algorithm is predicted to perform well. And then from that, we can infer the performance um, of an algorithm on any instance within the boundary of the space. So this is the framework. I, I leave the details for our papers. You can, you can read about uh, that later, but everything is based upon this framework. So let's talk now about the metadata requirements. Uh, when you're applying instance space analysis to a new problem, you have to think about the features. What makes your problem hard? What are the features that capture the difficulty of an instance? Uh, so then speaking of the instances, which instances should you collect that show enough diversity in those features? Which instances represent real world problems? And which instances are going to be adequate to show differences in algorithm performance? You don't want a bunch of instances where every algorithm performs the same. You will not learn anything. So we have to have sufficient diversity in features and instances. And algorithms too need diversity. We want to have algorithms that help us understand how the underlying mechanism of the algorithm works. You know, there are many algorithms that are pretty much the same thing with a different name, variations on the theme. Uh, there's no point having a portfolio filled with algorithms that essentially have the same underlying mechanism. You want a collection of algorithms that have very different fundamental ideas of how they search the space or find their solutions. Uh, and finally, the performance metric. How are we going to define what a good algorithm performance looks like? So in the context of timetabling, the case study that I'll keep coming back to, um, we are using 8,199 instances that have come from three different sources, the real world Italian university, the randomly generated, and the modified random generator to be real world like. 
we are using 32 features um, of timetabling problems that are based on characteristics of the timetabling problem itself, like the, you know, the number of lecture theatres, the number of students, the number of teachers, um, but also looking at some graph theory properties. Uh, underlying timetabling is a graph colouring problem. If you put all of the classes that have to be scheduled as, as nodes of a graph and connect edges where there's a reason they cannot occur at the same time because of teacher availability or student clashes or things, it, it turns into a graph colouring problem. There's many mathematical properties of graphs that we can measure that actually do affect the difficulty of the timetabling problem. We measure performance of the uh, timetabling algorithms by the number of student clashes that their best solution um, presents. And so we say good performance of an algorithm is the algorithm that has the best uh, solution, that is the minimal number of clashes. You could measure goodness in other ways, but for this case study, that's how we measure it. And the two algorithms are, of course, the simulated annealing and typical search algorithms that I mentioned before. So the methodology for instance space analysis, um, I'll take you through the steps and we'll use the timetabling case study to illustrate. So before instance space analysis, we have to collect our metadata, right? Our instances, our features, and our algorithm performance metrics. Then we have five key steps to the methodology. Step one, we create the instance space. And to do that, we have to do feature selection and dimensionality reduction. Uh, I'll talk about those in a minute. Step two, once we have our space, we can visualize where the benchmark problems lie within that space. We can see the theoretical boundary and we can examine the diversity. We can then also look at algorithm footprints across the space and understand their strengths and weakness and their uniqueness. If an algorithm has a footprint in a part of the space where no other algorithm's footprint lies, that's um, a useful algorithm that's making a, a unique contribution. We then have to try to explain those strengths and weaknesses by looking at features and how they're distributed across the space. So we can say, ah, this algorithm performs well in this part of the space for instances that have the following characteristics. Of course, we can fully automate, uh, automate this, this process um, using machine learning to learn to predict which algorithm is expected to perform best for instances with certain characteristics. And once the instance space analysis is completed, then we have the opportunity to uh, gain some insights. We can get insights into new features. We might want to think of features that are helping to separate instances that at the moment are lying on top of each other. But if we can think of, if we can look at those instances and we can think about a defining characteristic that separates them, then that's a, an idea for a new feature that may help um, separate mixed performance into good and bad. Uh, we can get insights into the new instances that are needed by trying to fill the gaps that we see in the instance space now, where we know we're lacking diversity. And we might also get insights into new algorithms or how to modify an algorithm to improve its footprint and improve the coverage across the space. And the thing to note is that this methodology is very iterative. So you get to the end, you get all these new insights about new features, new instances, new algorithms, and you might want to go back to the top and update your metadata uh, and then create the next instance space. And you keep going until convergence of the instance space. In other words, there's no new insights that are coming out and you, you get a really good understanding of how the instance characteristics affect the performance of algorithms. So let's go through each step with the timetabling case study. Uh, so first step, creating the instance space. So for timetabling, which features uh, are going to explain algorithm performance the best. So what we do is we do a correlation analysis to make sure we're choosing features that are actually, actually predictive of how the algorithms perform. And we do some clustering so that we're avoiding redundancies. And then we solve the optimization problem to find the optimal subset of the features that best separates the good and the bad. And we use machine learning techniques behind the scenes to arrive at that optimal subset. Uh, so genetic algorithms with um, machine learning uh, to evaluate the fitness function. Uh, and then how do we take that optimal subset of features and project to 2D um, in a way that separates the good and the bad? We, we want to see across the space, we want to see that the, uh, at this end we have quite easy instances for an algorithm and this end is quite hard and we want to understand those directions and those trends across the space and try to explain them. 
uh, it's so much more meaningful to break it apart that way and just summarize an average number. So we end up solving this optimization problem where we're trying to find the optimal projection, the optimal projection from our feature space to our 2D space. It's just a linear transformation. And we're trying to find the optimal matrix A that takes us from the feature space to a 2D projection. Uh, and there's some other matrices that we have to solve uh, in the process uh, in such a way that we're minimizing um, the deviation from a linear trend. We're trying to get projections that make the algorithm performance as linearly trendy as possible across the space and each feature distribution also quite linear in its trends and those directions are going to be really interesting all the details are in this paper we published in 2018 in the machine learning journal uh, including the appendix um, that shows that our our optimization procedure for arriving at the optimal um, projection matrix um, is uh, the, the proof of optimality is in the paper so in terms of the timetabling example then, we start with 32 initial features and we found uh, that there were five features that are selected to best separate the good and bad performances of the algorithms and where we define good as um, best. So an algorithm is good if out of the two, simulated kneeling or taboo search, it gets the best result. You could change that and have a different performance metric. You could say it's good if it has, you know, less than 1% of students have a clash or something. But this is our projection matrix. After we solve the optimization problem, we are projecting from this five dimensional feature space. These are our five selected features. So the slackness in the timetable, the number of one room events, these are, these are classes that can only be scheduled in one room in the university. So obviously if we have a large number of one room events, this is a very tightly constrained problem. Uh, and we have um, some features to do with the properties of the underlying graphs as well. And then we have this optimal projection matrix uh, that projects us to 2D. So we now have a mapping of all our instances into a 2D space. And we can ask the question, where do different instances lie in that space? And so this is our instance space for timetabling. And you can see that the blue instances are the University of Udine, Italian University, real world instances. The, the pink ones are randomly generated instances and the yellow ones are the real world like instances. So the first thing you see is that the Italian university instances are nothing like the randomly generated instances. We can see that immediately. They have very different features. And the real world like ones are something in between. They're closer to the blue uh, and they're based on the, the random generator, just changing some parameters. Uh, do these instances fill the theoretical boundary? Uh, no, they don't. There's plenty of room around the edges where we could be generating more instances. Are they, uh, possessing these five important properties. Well, we can only answer three of them at the moment and the rest of them depends on looking at algorithms, but are they demonstrably diverse? Um, diversity could be better. Uh, are they lacking bias? You can see the randomly generated instances um, just create a certain type of instance, you know, that they're not uh, particularly um, unbiased and you can imagine how some algorithms might be better suited to, to some instances than others. Do they span a range of real world contexts? Who knows from this space? We can see that all the instances don't cover where the Italian university instances are, but I don't know where all the other university instances are across this space. We can see that real world looks different from random. And we see that with a lot of our problems. Now we need to look at how algorithms perform across this space. In which regions do we expect algorithms to perform well or poorly? So on the left, we have simulated kneeling. And on the right is taboo search. And blue is a good performance, meaning best. And orange is not best. So the first thing we can see is that taboo search has a large orange region at the top part of the space where it is not the best algorithm. So remember, taboo search is best on average. But this view immediately shows you that there's a real weakness for taboo search at the top of the space. You should not use it. It is not best. I'm not saying it's not good, but I'm saying it's not best. So we can use machine learning then to understand these relationships and to carve up this space and tell us uh, which regions we should use which algorithm. So when we ask machine, a support vector machine to look at the simulated kneeling results and tell us where it expects good and bad performance to lie, these are the results we get. Blue is good, orange is bad, and the taboo search support vector machine 
recognises that it's too risky to use this method at the top of the space, but it's quite predicted to be good at the bottom of the space. Within this, we can ask how large is a footprint relative to other algorithms. So the simulated kneeling footprint, um, the good area occupies 58% of the space, but taboo search is 65% of the space. So the, the footprint is, is bigger for taboo search, um, but there's a, a real weakness here. For simulated kneeling, the percentage of good performances in the data is 70.6% and for uh, taboo search, 74.4%. The precision of the support vector machines is 86 and 89 percent. So, in other words, if you pay attention to the support vector machine and you only uh, apply simulated kneeling where it says it should be good, it's right 86 percent of the time. Uh, do these footprints overlap the real world instances? Uh, no, you remember the real world instances are out here. So, both support vector machines are predicting that the algorithms will not be good or sorry, will not be best on the Italian university instances. In other words, it's too close to call. It's not prepared to say which one is going to be best. We don't have enough data. Are these footprints unique? Yeah, you can see there's a commonality at the bottom. They both find those instances easy at the bottom, but at the top, it's only simulated kneeling um, that has the best performance. Of course, we now need to try to understand why that is. What is it about the region at the top of the space that makes taboo search have a weakness and simulated milling have a strength? So we can examine the distribution of features across the space. We can look for correlations with directions of hardness. Uh, we see, for instance, slack. When slack is high, orange is, uh, yellow is a high value. When slack is high, uh, that explains that region up the top there. We can look at the different instances um, in the different classes and try to understand how the distribution of features from low blue value through to high yellow value affects um, how we would describe the instances in different parts of the space. And we can understand the strengths and weaknesses that way. Um, we can also see whether or not we think there's other features that um, would better explain uh, these relationships. Finally, we can put all this together. Uh, the two support vector machines in this case can be combined into an overall algorithm selector. Uh, and if we have, um, so for a given instance, you say, for this support vector machine, do you think it's going to be good or bad? For this support vector machine, do you think that, that algorithm will be good or bad? If they have tied performance, in other words, they both think that the algorithm will be good, we select the one that has the highest precision uh, to break ties. And we end up with this um, situation where the support vector machines are quite confident you should use simulated kneeling here in the green, you should use taboo search here in the red, and the grey region, it doesn't know. It's not prepared to say which algorithm is going to be best. This tells us where we need more instances or maybe better features to separate the mixed uh, results that we see. Okay, so if you use the selector, um, the probability that you select a good algorithm is 83.9%, whereas if you always use simulated kneeling, you're looking at 70.6%, always to research 74.4. So the selector um, helps you make a better choice than picking your favorite algorithm. So there's a number of insights that can come from uh, such instance based analysis. There's insights into the, uh, the instances. Um, I won't dwell on these um, except to say that we can see that the Italian university instances have very different properties to random instances. Uh, we can describe them. They have lower slack values compared to the real world like generator. Um, harder instances are created by large values of standard deviation of event size, but these are not necessarily discriminating. There's lots of things that you can, um, you can realise when you look at the instances in this way. Um, most importantly, we realise that the real-world competition instances are not really helping us identify the unique strengths and weaknesses of these two very competitive algorithms. Um, the instances are either easy for both, um, or if one beats the other, it's very, very close. Um, and that the real-world like instances are more discriminating because that's the, the random generator was changed to, to make the instances real world like and more discriminating. So there's a lot of opportunity for generating instances that, that have these useful properties. There's insights into algorithms. Um, we can understand the conditions where both algorithms perform quite similarly and where one performs better than the other in terms of the instance characteristics. Uh, and so much more insight than an average can afford us.
And I should note uh, when saying that this is an iterative process, since that analysis, I have um, embarked on an international collaboration with um, colleagues in Austria and Italy, where they've taken this metadata um, that's up on Matilda, and they've added more features, like over 2,000 features of timetabling problems, more instance classes, uh, more algorithms, and this is the instance space now. And you can see in the little rectangle here, those are the Italian university competition instances. The blue ones, the, the bright blue ones, the aqua, are the instances from our real world light generator. Uh, they've also sourced more real university timetabling problems. These are the purple ones. So you can see universities are quite diverse in uh, the kinds of instances that they have. It's not all just what Italian, this University of Udine instances look like. They can be all the way down here. And the grey ones are instances that have been generated in this new study um, to fill a new instance space based on an extensive list of features. The algorithms that have been studied are answer set programming, a hybrid meta heuristic um, simulated annealing and a constraint satisfaction algorithm. And you can see that there's a lot of tied performance in black here at the top where the easy instances are. And then it's um, the exact solvers uh, cannot find a solution for the, the problems down here, which are larger. So, so this is ongoing work, not yet published. Um, and, uh, and that's what I mean about an iterative process. The insights lead to new ideas, uh, and so it goes. So that was my overview of instance space analysis. And now let's move on to Matilda, which is the online tool that we have created for uh, enabling all researchers to access this methodology. So Matilda is a website at matilda.unimelb.edu.au. You can go there and create your own user account, and then you can either uh, take a look at our library problems that I'll talk about in a minute, or you can go about creating your own instance space analysis for a problem for your choice. The tools are all there. Uh, on the website, you can read all about the project and our team and the methodology, and there's links for how you can get started creating your own. So very quickly, let me just say, because um, it's all on the website if you want to read in more detail, the motivation for developing Matilda was to provide this online tool for everyone to have access. Um, you can generate your own instance spaces and your own visualisation that I hope people will start to include in their papers as evidence of their algorithm's strength, but also their weakness. Honestly reporting how your algorithm performs across the broadest possible instance space. Uh, it also gives you an opportunity for more insights and, and to improve algorithms. Matilda also provides an online library of successful case studies where instance space analysis has been applied for a very wide range of problems in what I will call algorithmic science, ranging from various combinatorial optimization problems, continuous optimization, machine learning time series, and software testing. And it's also an online repository where we're storing the benchmark instances that fill these diverse instance spaces for lots of problems and the feature calculation code. And in the spirit of open source and reproducibility, uh, we want Matilda to be uh, a resource uh, to support that. Uh, just very quickly on the, the acronym Matilda, it stands for something. It stands for Melbourne Algorithm Test Instance Library with Data Analytics. But being Australian, um, it's also an important um, name for us. Matilda is widely regarded as Australia's um, uh, national anthem, the song Walsing Matilda, uh, after the poem by Andrew Patterson. So it's got an Australian connotation and also the women's soccer team in Australia is known as the Matildas. So that's kind of nice. And being an Australian female, um, another nice reference for the, the name Matilda is, uh, is acknowledgement of the Matilda effect. This is where there have been women who have contributed to so much advancement of knowledge and innovation, but not being recognised because of societal biases, you know, where um, the man in the team gets the Nobel Prize, for instance. And so this Matilda effect, I encourage you to have a look at the Wikipedia entry on that. Uh, and by um, calling our online resource Matilda, we are also acknowledging the contributions of the invisible and unapplauded uh, on whose shoulders we all stand. The logo also has symbolism. Um, it looks a little bit like stars. Um, the instances are stars and the boundary is the uh, algorithm footprint. Um, and if you consider that also looks a little bit like a traveling salesman problem or a Hamiltonian cycle. 
and you may also note if you know your astronomy very well the southern cross over on the, the right there um, which is what we see when we look up at the skies from here where we see the southern hemisphere uh, in Melbourne. So on Matilda the library problems you'll find uh, all these ones um, greyed out are the ones that are coming over the coming months. These are all instant spaces that are currently being built and we hope to release those soon. But the ones in white um, you can already browse when you go to the Matilda website. Uh, so now let's um, revisit the timetabling problem. I'll show you the Matilda website and, uh, and you'll see some of those pictures we've already seen before. Uh, so let me get open the Matilda website. And so here is the website. Here are you can read about Matilda and, and the team and the methodology. Here's the library problems under optimization. All of these ones are there and learning and model fitting, the machine learning stuff, anomaly detection, facial age estimation. But let's have a look at the timetable. So for each problem, we have um, a brief description of it. Uh, there's some publications where you can get more information about the features and, and the data. You can download the metadata uh, so you can run the instance space analysis and, and it should be fully reproducible with the instance space. There's a summary here of, uh, of our insights and you click on view then you see the timetable in instance space. This is our projection of our 32 features that got reduced through feature selection down to five that then get projected from 5D to 2D by this linear transformation. And this is the optimal matrix that our MATLAB code behind the scenes um, solved the optimization problem. Projecting into the space, we can look at the distribution of sources, where the instances came from. And so you've seen that picture before. Here we have the real world Italian university instances. When you hover uh, your mouse over the instances, you get more information. So you can see the source here is the competition and you can see this is instance number six from the competition. Um, over here are the randomly generated instances and the yellow ones are the real world like instances. And you can see the theoretical boundary now, I should say that theoretical boundaries work out mathematically by taking the upper and lower bounds of each of the features, in this case the five features, and projecting it to 2D. And that's the boundary within which all instances can theoretically lie. They may not actually occupy that whole space, but we would like to be able to generate new instances that try to fill that space as richly as possible. There's many different graphs that you can look at. Uh, you can look at the support vector machine, um, recommendation and when it loads, there we go. And um, you can also see down here some analysis of the footprints. So the area of each footprint, 58%, 65% of the space, the density, the purity of those footprints uh, and the performance of the support vector machines. Um, you can look at their overall accuracy and their precision and here we see for simulated annealing, uh, it is good 70.6% of, of, of the instances. To research is good for 74.4% of the instances. The Oracle, of course, if you're, only, if you're always just picking which method is actually best, is going to be best 100% of the time. That's our, our stretch goal there. Uh, but the selector gets, picks the best method 83.9% of the time. So you can look at this analysis and decide whether or not the instance space, um, the, the machine learning within the instance space has learned anything useful uh, and whether your automated algorithm selection is accurate. Uh, and it also gives you a good feel for whether or not you've built a space that makes sense and that the features are truly predictive of how algorithms will perform. So that's my 45 minutes. Um, I hope that's been a useful Introduction to Instance Space Analysis and how you can uh, use Matilda uh, to do your own instance space. And now I'll hand over to my colleague, uh, Mario Andres Munoz, who's been with me for the last six years or so, um, taking the ideas of instance space analysis and extending them and, and making them available through the MATLAB code that he's developed. He's gonna take you through um, how to run that code with a live script 
and how to um, understand the, the parameters that are involved in getting the best performance out of Matilda. Uh, thank you and please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any uh, questions or suggestions and uh, thank you.